Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being quiet before I get to start. So that's my cue that I'm a little late, so sorry about that. Welcome to Sunday Worship. On behalf of Becky and her family, uh, we wanted to just uh, say thank you to those who participated or attended yesterday's funeral. Uh, some of you were there in person with us and others were online. So, but I just wanted to express thanksgiving to our church family for your prayers and support for Becky and her family. And we pray that you will continue to be mindful of them. Um, it was a beautiful service. We had a good weather. There was lots of people there. Just to hear those words of uh, celebration and just memories was a blessed thing. So I hope in some way that, Becky, that was a way to really encourage you and uh, give you a sense of peace and thanksgiving for that. Um, let's begin with a moment of silent prayer as we just prepare for holy worship today. Please join me in today's call to worship. The Lord be with you. How blessed are we when we keep God's law and meditate on God's justice. Then let us praise the Lord with upright hearts and open minds. Let us worship God together. Let us pray. God, who is first and last in all things, creator of the world, redeemer of our lives, giver of the law and source of mercy, you are the light of minds that seek to know you. You are the strength of those who seek to serve you. You give rest to those who go in search of you. In our worship, we pause in your presence. We rest from our work and responsibilities. We rest from our play, from our worries and distractions. We come now before you to enjoy you, to enjoy your beauty, to enjoy your world and our life in you. Hear us now as we pray this prayer of confession. God, who is all in all, you call us to walk in your light, but too often we choose a darkness of despair or disappointment. You give life in abundance, but too often we choose to consume too much and take more than our share. You have called us to follow new directions, but we cling to the paths we know. You have called us to reach out in love, but we prefer to protect ourselves without taking any risk. Forgive us, O oh God. Help us to put our trust in you and lead us to wholeness and peace, to adventure and new life through Christ our Lord. Brothers and sisters, as we enter into holy worship, let us hear the good news, the assurance of pardon. When the Israelites stood on the frontier of the promised land, God invited them to choose life and the blessing that comes from following his way. God's call to life is refreshed each day. Today we have an opportunity once again. Let us accept God's gift of life and forgiveness. Let us forgive one another and let us discover life in abundance in Christ's name. Amen. With that assurance of pardon and good news resting in our hearts, let us now invite our praise team to come forward and lead us in songs of praise. Good morning. We're going to start this morning with a little 
pick up livelier song, if that's okay with you, uh, called Build Your Kingdom Here. Um, this song captures a part of the Lord's Prayer, um, which we pray every week, um, where Jesus taught the disciples to pray, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Matthew 6.10. And this song also reminds us of Jesus' command to seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. I like the song for its upbeatness, but also for its reminder of God's mission to the church, which begins with each one of us. So please stand if you're able and join us in singing, Build Your Kingdom Here. One, two, one, two. Come set your rule and reign. Our hearts are born, increase in us we pray, and will I were may come set our hearts ablaze with hope, a wildfire in our very souls, Holy Spirit. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was the Word, the one who died for our sins so that we could have eternal life with God. Bless his holy name. Beautiful. 
Thank you, praise team, for leading us into worship with such beautiful songs. Let's dismiss our children with our blessings and prayers as they join their teachers in Sunday school. As they do so, let's take a moment to just uh, share with you a couple of announcements. A reminder that we do send out newsletters each during the week, and so we ask you to, to at least uh, look at those so you know what's happening in our church family and allows us on Sundays just to highlight the key things. Session is meeting this week for our monthly meeting ahead of our annual general meeting next month. There's a lot to do, so we do ask for your prayers that we may be open to God's leading and his counsel as we seek wisdom in a few important matters. Today is the soft deadline for nomination, so it's not too late. If God's been tugging at your heart and and today's the day. We hope and pray that God has submitted some names to us, and so we're going to uh, compile those names this coming Tuesday evening. As well, we're going to look over the budget that the Board of Managers has submitted to session for our approval. So please pray for us as we uh, prepare for that meeting. Uh, next weekend, Family Day weekend, uh, just to give you a heads up, the young adults will be away on their retreat starting from Saturday until Monday. So we ask for your prayers as we 
go up to a place called Tiny Ontario. I hope it's not a tiny place and we can find it easily, but that's the name of the place. We're going to be up there for three days, so uh, please pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us there safely, and also that we may have a great time of worship and fellowship uh, and community as we spend some time with each other and with God. So that's next coming weekend. The other announcements, I'll leave it to you. You can find that in the newsletter. Would you pray with me as we give thanks for the offering and prepare to hear today's teaching and receive it as God's word to us? God in heaven, we thank you as we gather once again as your people. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives, especially when we go through the ups and downs of life. Even in the unexpected happenings of life, Lord, in faith, we claim that you are good and faithful and that you are always with us. In moments of sorrow and trial, we just ask, O oh God, that you remember, we remember that you are with us and that you give us the peace and comfort that we truly need. You give us the strength to now carry on. Lord, with all these things in our hearts, we want to give you thanks for all these things and more. So Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts, we simply give back to you what you have first gave, given to us. This is our offering, and we pray that you will bless it and give wisdom to the elders of this church so that all will be used in a way that makes a difference in this world. Build your kingdom here on this earth. Lord, we want to continue our time of worship with the hearing of your word. We pray for open hearts and open minds to receive what you have to say to us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. Today, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to ask you to, if you have your Bible, look at, uh, open it to Jeremiah chapter 1, as we kick off a uh, uh, new teaching series beginning today for about four weeks. Uh, I'm going to tie it into what I'm going to say at the uh, Young Adult uh, Retreat as well uh, on Saturday uh, when we get up there for the opening session. Before we do that, I'm going to do what I forgot to do a couple of weeks ago, and so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Wing to put this on the screen. You remember this picture? When we concluded our um, New Year series, I wanted to give you something to visually remind you. Uh, this teaching series, in a way, is an extension of that. Not that I'm going to repeat other things, but I wanted to um, like, take the next step and inspire you, hopefully. And with that, I wanted to remind you, what is it that you are seeing? What is it? Is it just a block, or is it? do you see the horse? Or it might not be a horse for you. It might be something else. So to help you with that process, for the next four weeks or so, we're going to look at how do we find and discover God's plan for my life. The working title is My Place in This World. How do I find out what God wants of me? What does God want that block of marble to be for your life? So I wanted to just have a tie into our previous uh, teaching series and, uh, and use that as a way to kick off things for this coming uh, series as well. Uh, the title of today's lesson is God's Game Plan, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 to verse 10. The title was chosen because today is Super Bowl Sunday. And so I want to congratulate all the football fans, David Chu, for being here rather than being at home, getting ready with all the food and you know, watching all the pregame stuff. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, we're using this opportunity as a way to just uh, make a connection to what's going on in our lives, but hopefully allow God to use me to speak to you in a way that you can use in your uh, daily life. So let's begin. Actually, I want to start with this. Uh, Philadelphia Eagles fans. Oh, none of you. So then the rest of you are Kansas City? Kansas City, okay. Uh, I really wanted uh, San Francisco 49ers to, to get to the Super Bowl. Because of Brock Purdy, if you guys are football fans, you know what I'm talking about. He has a great story. 
Uh, he is not, he's a Christian, by the way. Uh, he's very uh, open about his Christian faith. Uh, that's not the reason why I want to root for him, but he has a great underdog story. And so Google it if you're interested, but I would have thought if he made it all the way and actually even won, it would be a great a story and an illustration for a future message or whatnot. But anyway, thank you for being with us. I hope that this will be an interesting and a challenging time with you. Um, is it me or does it seem like the hype of the Super Bowl gets bigger each year and starts earlier? In the midst of all the media, media hoopla, all the you know, analysis shows and who's going to do what at the halftime and all the commercials that we are looking, uh, anticipating to watch at halftime and so on and so on. You know what the two teams, Philadelphia and Kansas City, were doing in those, uh, what, what they were doing? For two weeks, they were preparing for today's game. So they've been watching videos of the other team, looking for weaknesses, developing strategies of attack so that they can put together a game plan for the most important game of the season. Now, reflecting on that, it makes me think and remember that football is not played at all like I thought football is played as a kid. And I think many of you can identify with this. I just assumed when I was a kid, you see the teams, right? You see, I assume that both teams just show up on Sunday, you know, and when your team gets the ball, uh, the quarterback will say, okay, let's try this play. Let's see if we can fool them. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try this play. Maybe this will fool them. So in, in, in my mind, as a, as a child watching the game, not knowing anything, I, I just thought that every play that did not result in a touchdown was a fail. Because I knew nothing about playing for field position. I knew nothing about the importance of time of possession. I knew nothing about controlling the line of scrimmage and so on and so on. I just thought that you were just supposed to try to score with every play. I mean, when you and I were children, isn't that how we played football during recess? You know, the quarterback just does a Hail, Hail Mary and we just hope that you catch it. But that's not how it's done in professional football, in a national football league. Instead, each coach approaches each game with what? A plan, a specific plan. Namely, this is what we will do when this happens. This is how we will shut down their running game. This is how we will exploit their weaknesses in their secondary. This is how we will position ourselves for the big play and on and on and on. Professional, basketball, professional football, and since about 90% of the players in the professional football league, they really play at the same level because truly, there really are just a few true superstars. The rest of them, they're all professional players, right? So about 90% of them play at the same level. The team with the best game plan usually wins the game. And that's why when a team consistently loses, who gets fired? The coach. The coach gets fired. We can understand this. Some of us, we approach life like we played football during recess time. Namely, every play is like a whole new game. It's just one desperate attempt Hail Mary to find something that works. Some of us approach life that way. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Instead, you and I, we can follow a game plan that has the potential to turn your life into one long championship season. Why? Because God has a game plan for your life. So today, Super Bowl Sunday, we're going to look at how, does, how can this work? How can I open myself so that God can implement 
his game plan into my life. So it has a true practical uh, result in my daily life. Again, I'm going to ask you to take out your Bible, turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, or you can turn on your phones. Let me share with you three strategic game plan principles I want you to consider. What does it mean with going with God's game plan in my life? First of all, it means you and I need to remember that your job is to run the plays, not to call the plays. Your job, my job, is to run the plays, not to call the plays. Look at what God said to Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. What does that mean? It means that God had a game plan for Jeremiah. God had a game plan for Jeremiah's life. God appointed Jeremiah to accomplish a certain task. What does that mean? That means, in other words, Jeremiah's decision to become a prophet was not the result of him, you know, weighing his options. He went to career day at school, visiting different booths as to what career path should I follow, and he didn't just weigh his odds. That's not how he became a prophet. His decision to become a prophet was based upon God's plan for his life. As we begin this teaching series, I want you to think about, reflect, meditate on the the fact that God has a plan for your life too. Before you were born, you were set apart to do something uniquely designed for you. In other words, God has a game plan for you. Now that sounds good, but there's a problem. You know what the problem is? The problem is that sometimes we think we're Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning, for those of you who know, he won, I think it was the 50th Super Bowl, right? David, I'm asking for confirmation. You need to work, you need to work with me, man, right? <laughs> Today is Super Bowl 57. I think it was Super Bowl 50. He won, and then he retired. But we think we are like Peyton Manning. I mention his name because he was unique among quarterbacks in that he was one of very few that was allowed to call his own Plays. So he may get instructions from the coach, but as he gets ready and he observes the landscape, so to speak, what's out in front of him, the defense, he could change what the play was. We need to understand that most quarterbacks get their plays from the sidelines, from the coaches, including great quarterbacks in history like John Elway and Joe Montana and others and others. They get their calls from the sideline. Why? Because their job was not to call the plays. Their job was to run the plays. And that's the way it's supposed to work with you and me, people of God. That's the way it is for us. The key to success, the key to success is not in figuring out what am I good at. What do I do best? How can I maximize my talents? The key to success is not in finding out what do you enjoy the most and then learning how to make a living at it. The key to success and ultimate satisfaction is discovering God's plan for your life and doing it. That's the important distinction that I want all of us to pick up on. God's game plan is not something you discover. Sorry, God's game plan is something you discover, not something you decide. We need to learn to see ourselves as, you know, we are on a team, God's team. And we need to learn to see God as the one who is calling the plays. Some of you might say, okay, that sounds good. If God's plan is something I discover, not something I decide, then my question is how? 
how, how do I discover that? How do I find God's plan for my life? The simple answer is you do it the same way Jeremiah did it. You listen. You listen to God. You let God tell you. Now, I'm not talking about hearing an audible voice. That happens to very, very few of us in very special, special circumstances. That, that does happen. I want to believe that. But for the most part, I'm not talking about it in an a, a audible voice. I'm talking about hearing God's voice in the words of Scripture, in the teachings of Scripture, in the preachings that you hear on a regular basis. I'm also talking about um, hearing God's voice through godly counsel as you share with one another, as you pray for and with one another. This isn't new. All of us know this. We've discussed this before. However, at this point, let me just give you or offer you a sub-point. When it comes to discovering God's plan, you will know what you need to know when you need to know it. This is very important. If my job is to just run the place, not call them, and I'm supposed to take responsibility to listen to God's voice, we need to keep this in mind. You will know what you need to know when you need to know it. This is important because many people want to know everything now. We want to know the whole picture now. And in my experience, that does not happen that way. God does not lead us that way. A coach's plan for the fourth quarter is going to be very different from his plan for the first quarter. Make sense? So when the game begins, no coach wants his players to say to him, Hey, coach, what plays are we going to run during the fourth quarter? The game hasn't even started. But we want to know, what are we going to do in the fourth quarter? By the way, if we go into overtime, then what do you want us to do? No coach wants that. The coach wants his team to focus on what? Now. What's happening now, not what's happening next. So I offer to you that connection to you and I, that God would tell you all that you need to know when you need to know it. In our opening call to worship, we talked about the adventure that God calls us to. God will tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. He will give you as much direction as you need to do his will. He will give you as much light on your path as you need to follow his footsteps. The crucial difference about following God's game plan for your life, my life, our life, the crucial difference is that we recognize he is the one that calls the plays. We're just the ones who run them. Again, that's because God's plan is something you discover, not something you decide. So I offer to you this challenge as we begin this teaching series. When you think about your future, when you make choices about your future, let those choices be driven by questions such as, what do you want me to do, God? God, what do you want me to do? To do. What is your plan for me? God, you call the plays. I will run them. What is my place in this world? How do we discover God's plan for my life? First and foremost, foundational, your job is to run the place. It's not to tell God how to do it. Our job is to run the place, not to call him. Number two, in going with God's game plan, remember, the best defense is a good offense. The best defense is a good offense. Now, initially you may think that doesn't make sense, but I think it does. Back to our reading, God gave Jeremiah a word. He said, I appointed you as a prophet. Before you were born, you were assigned. I appointed you as a prophet. A prophet. What happened? Immediately, Jeremiah 
began making objections and excuses. Look at verse 6. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said. This is Jeremiah. I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. What is he doing? Jeremiah is saying, I don't know how to do what you are asking me to do, God. It's not that I don't hear your voice. I hear you, but I don't know how to do what you are asking me to do. And even if I did know how to do what you're asking me to do, I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to do it. Objections and excuses. I mean, for a, for a moment, let's side with Jeremiah. We can imagine what Jeremiah was thinking. People won't accept me. People won't accept me. They won't listen. And we all know that prophets sometimes, prophets sometimes, well, we're not really well received. What if they beat me up, God? What if they beat me up? What if they throw rocks at me? What if they laugh at me? What if they don't even listen? They disregard me altogether. And I'm sure Jeremiah was wondering, how am I supposed to defend myself? How do I defend myself against those who will challenge my calling? You heard God tell you what to do? Who do you think you are? What do I do? How do I defend myself against those who challenge my calling? These are, I think, legit questions, right? Well, what did God say in response? He says, basically, you don't. You don't defend yourself. I don't want you to play defense. I want you to play offense. Do what I called you to do. Look at verse 7 and 8. Take a look. The Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. What is God saying to Jeremiah? Jeremiah, Jeremiah, don't play defense. Play offense. Play offense. The key principle here is obedience. Obedience. Doing what God tells you to do. Saying what God tells you to say. Going where God tells you to go. God is telling Jeremiah that, you know what, Jeremiah, if you are committed to obeying me, it doesn't matter what other people say. If you are committed to me, obeying me, it doesn't matter what other people feel or think or say or do. What is my place in this world? How do I discover what God wants me to do? The same goes for you and me. No doubt, hopping on number one, your job is to run the plays, not call them, hearing God's voice. No doubt, in faith, I'm going to believe that many of you, if not all of you, you have a sense of God's calling on your life. But let's be honest. That calling in your life, it's being blocked. It's being obstructed by what? Yours and mine objections, and excuses. And God wants to say, stop making excuses. Forget your objections. Don't say that you cannot do it, and don't get sidetracked by what other people might think and say. Instead, play offense. Start doing what I have called you to do. There's a cliche, and I think it's very true. You and God, you are the majority. Think about that. You and God, you are the majority. You and God, you are a winning team. So if you are committed to doing what God tells you to do, God will see you through. He will see you through it. Here's the principle, the takeaway for point number two. 
Obedience overcomes obstacles. It's not that we don't have barriers. It's not that we don't have difficulties. It's not that we don't have obstacles. That's part of life. But obedience overcomes obstacles. And make no mistake, when you and I make that decision to say yes to God, to decide to follow, not my game plan, God, because it's not my job to to call the place. My job is to run the place. So I would decide to follow you. Does that mean it's smooth sailing? We all know, no. That's false religion. That does not happen. We know that when we decide to follow God's will, you will face obstacles. And sometimes, for some of us, countless obstacles. We face difficulties. We will face them along the way. It's not a smooth ride. I would never say that that's what God teaches us or that's what the Bible promises us. No. It's not a smooth ride, but the promise is that yours and mine obedience will get you through. Staying faithful to God will get you through. Remaining in God's presence will get you through. Get through what? The obstacles that cross your path. Look at verse 8 once again. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them, God says to Jeremiah. Why? For I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. The best defense against critics, the best defense against your fears, the best defense against obstacles, you know what it is? It's a good offense. A good offense. Offense, And by offense, I mean being focused on doing what God has called you to do. The best defense in life is a good offense. Number three, in going with God's game plan, we remember also, again, your job is to run the plays, not to call them. Number two, the best defense is a good offense. Number three, know this. Every play is a crucial play. Every play is a crucial play. For those of you who watch sports regularly, um, again, I'm going to use football analogy, but have you ever noticed how much sports announcers love to exaggerate, you know, one play? Right? They, they love to exaggerate the importance of one single play in a ball game. Right? So they love to say things like, ladies and gentlemen, this is the play of the game. It all comes down to this. Right? The season, the team's season may be riding on the outcome of this play. The, the coach's future might be determined by whether or not that they can convert to this crucial third down, and on and on and on, right? That's part of the job. They they love to breathe hyperbole, right? They love that. They love to overemphasize the significance of a single plan. But we do this as fans too, don't we, right? Especially when we see such a bad mistake, right? Oh, man. Right? When, like the Leafs, they lost yesterday. I can't believe it. They were at 2 nothing, and then they lost. Rob, how does that happen? Fans, we do this too. But you know what? Every choice, every coach will tell you, in his right mind anyway, any knowledgeable and wise coach will tell you that games are not won or lost on a single play. Right? Seasons don't ride on one single play. Careers are not made by one single play. Instead, every play matters. Every play matters. Yes, you and I, when we watch the news, we see the highlights. We see that some plays are more spectacular than other plays. Yes, we don't deny that, but... Every play is a crucial play. It took numerous runs or numerous downs to get to that point. 
in our lives, every day is a crucial day. And you know what the most crucial day is? The most crucial day? The most crucial day is this day. This play. The most crucial day is today. Listen to verse 9 and verse 10. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. Remember, Jeremiah complained his objection was, I don't know how to speak. I'm just a child. I put my words in your mouth. I am with you, Jeremiah. But then look what he says in verse 10. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. What's the key word? Today, I appoint you. Today, I appoint you. Not someday, Jeremiah, you're going to be a great prophet. Someday, Jeremiah, you're going to have a call on your your life. No. God said, today, I appoint you. When you and I discover God's plan for your life, when that happens, then this day is the day to start moving in that direction. This doesn't mean God will give you a championship ring. You know, on the first, halfway through the first quarter of your first year, doesn't mean that it still means that you, it means that you still have to play out the rest of the season you still have to play out the rest of the season every game every down but with every play every down every single play you're moving toward the call that God has placed in your life Uh, on my personal reading time, on my Kindle, I'm reading, currently I'm, I'm reading a book on Billy Graham. Uh, it's a, this book is a compilation of all the interviews he gave throughout his life, and it's sectioned on, you know, Billy Graham on politics, Billy Graham on this and this and so forth. It's a compilation of all of his uh, interviews throughout his life. Now, we all know Billy Graham. God called Billy Graham to be one of the most influential Christian leaders of our era. God appointed Billy Graham to preach the gospel to millions, millions, to lead multiple thousands to Christ, even to council presidents and kings all over the world. Now, I don't know if you know the story of his uh, early days, but when Billy Graham accepted Christ as a teenager, as a young lad, as a young teenager, and he surrendered himself to God calling in his life to preach the gospel. When he did that, when he accepted the call, the, accepted Christ as a teenager and surrendered to preach, God's call on his life was then activated. It was activated. It was activated, but hear this. It was decades. It was years. It was decades before God's game plan for Billy Graham fully unfolded. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? As a teenager, he made that decision. It was activated, but it was years, it was decades before that plan of God for Billy Graham was fully unfolded. But the point is, it was activated when Billy Graham surrendered to the call. And in hindsight, In this position, in where we stand in this side of history, I'm sure all of us can agree that Billy Graham lived every single day like it was a crucial day. God has made a call on your life. And it may be decades. It may be decades before that plan fully unfolds but it can be activated today. Today. Today you can say, God, whatever it is that you have for me, I will do it. I will do it. And with your help, I will live every day like it is the most important play.
Let's wrap things up. Three words to summarize going with God's game plan for your life. Three words. Consistently surrendering to his leadership. Consistently because every day is a crucial day. Not just on Sundays. (laughs) Monday to Saturday, I'm going to do my own thing, God. Consistently because every day is a crucial day. Surrendering because it's his leadership. It's God's leadership. Active obedience. Surrender to God. His leadership, because again, it's God who calls the plays. I don't know who you are favoring to win today, Philadelphia Eagles or San Francisco, uh, sorry, Kansas City. I really wanted San Francisco to win, whether it's Kansas City Chiefs. You know what? In a year or two, and maybe even possibly as early as July, Many of us will be hard-pressed to remember who won today's game. I don't even remember who was in the Super Bowl last year. Many of us will be hard-pressed to remember who won today's game. You know why? Because it's just a game. It's just a game. Sorry, David. It's just a game. (laughs) It doesn't have eternal significance. But your life is different. My life is different. It does matter for eternity what you accomplish. It does matter. And if you try to call the plays for yourself, I'm going to be blunt, you will lose. So let God make that play. Let God turn your life into a championship season. How? The main point. Follow God's game plan for your life. What does that mean? Consistently surrender to God's leadership. What is my place in this world? How do I discover what God wants me to do? First step. This is my hope and prayer for all of you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take a moment. Think about it what God may be saying to you through his spirit as we invite our elder Winston to come forward and lead us in prayer. Okay, this is our uh, time of prayer, um, prayers of hope, and uh, we're praying for others. And um, then we will be praying for uh, the Lord's Prayer after. So we thank you, uh, Pastor Billy, for your message today and for encouraging us to uh, and, and follow uh, what God calls us to do. Okay, let us pray. We thank you, Lord for your desire to always have a relationship with us. Forgive us, Father, for, um, and help us to overthrow and tear down our selfish ways, God, that distance us from you and prevents us from doing what you call us to do. Inspire and encourage us to share your word, your love and compassion, just like Jesus did. Thank you that we can bring our prayers to you, Lord. We pray for Becky and her family. We're thankful that they were able to have a beautiful service yesterday to celebrate the life of their father, grandfather, Mr. Pew Kit Ning. May the memories of all the love and care Mr. Ng showered onto his family and knowing that he is with his wife and with you in heaven and may continue to comfort Becky and her extended family. Please fill their broken hearts with your peace, comfort, and strength in the coming days and months. We thank you, God, for um, um, giving the young adults the time for their retreat this coming weekend. And uh, we pray that uh, they will have a good time of uh, fellowship and bonding together, supporting each other, building friendships, and learning more about, about, about Jesus. 
keep them safe as they travel and, and in their activities, God. Be with Pastor Billy and Mark as they lead and teach your word. We pray for those who we, our church support, who are here in, in Canada or in different countries. We pray that you will continue to look over them, keep them safe and healthy, and protect them wherever they are. Uplift them, God, with, with energy and resources they need to build their ministries. We lift up to you, Lord, Lord, those who may be experiencing illness, depression, anxiety, job stress, or job loss, or work and relationship challenges. Provide them the medical help they need or resources they need to get through their challenges. We pray that we can be, their sh the, sh be the shoulders they can lean on during, during this time, Lord. Fill our hearts with love and compassion so that we can encourage them during, during their time of need. Father, we pray for the people in Syria and Turkey in the aftermath of all the devastating earthquakes there. We pray for the first responders and emergency and rescue crews. Provide them health, energy, and safety. The people there need hope, God courage and strength to face the loss of loved ones and the overwhelming challenges they have ahead. We pray that the rest of the world will come to their aid in providing resources and financial funds and that we will also give what, what we can too. We pray for the people in Ukraine, give them strength to fight and survive. As the war escalates, God, Give them hope as they sur they are surrounded by destruction, cold weather, and losing more loved ones. We are thankful for the UN countries that are providing aid and help to to Ukraine. We pray for the end of, to this war, God, for mercy and peace, because you are the light, hope, power, and love. Thank you, God, our Heavenly Father, that we can lift our prayers to you our struggles, our anxieties, our doubts, and matters in this world we can't comprehend and feel helpless about. Be our faith. We put our faith and our trust in you, Lord. Thank you for being our rock, our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you that we can cast all our cares upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand if you're able. As we close our service with this last song, Speak, O Lord.
What is my place in this world? How do I discover God's unique plan for me? As we begin this journey together, brothers and sisters, on this Super Bowl Sunday, I ask of you, consider following God's plan for your life. Consistently surrender to God's leadership. God in heaven, we thank you for an opportunity for us to gather once more as we face the week ahead. Thank you for your presence in our time of worship and your promise to be with us each and every single day. In faith, we thank you for your goodness and all that you would do in and through us this week. Help us, Lord, to take steps in order that we may live out your plan for us. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times we simply just gave excuses or objections. Forgive us when we simply thought it was my life, it's my place, it's my job to run the plays or to call the plays. In humility, we ask of you, speak once again to us, that we may know the heights of your great plan for us. And we pray that our hearts will be changed so that we may truly hear and simply obey. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we all pray. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.